Hello and welcome to another programme in the series Reflections here on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire, a weekly half-hour spot where I spend time in the company of a guest. Now this week, that guest is a man who, having spent many years, what might well be called a jobbing actor, first came to prominence as the result of a role in the television comedy series It Ain't Half Hot Mum. He's the actor John Clegg, and when I met him, I asked him first of all where and when he was born. I was born in 1934 in what was then British India uh, and is now Pakistan, in a little place called Murray, which my parents always described as Tunbridge Wells in the hills. Uh, my father was uh, uh, in the army. He was uh, then in the Hampshires, which later became the Royal Hampshires. Uh, he ended up as a lieutenant colonel. He was then, I should think, a captain, I think. Yes, I should think a captain or a major, perhaps. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had a sister who was just a little bit older than me. She was born in Naushira. And then later on, there was a sort of big gap, and then I had another sister who was born during the war. They have both married very nice people. One has married a, uh, a schoolmaster, a man who, who I was at school with, who was sort of my best friend. Um, and she helps him run a prep school in Wiltshire. And my other sister married a man who has done many different things and eventually ended up as uh, editor of the Surrey magazine. When you say your father was in the army at the time, was he in fact a career soldier? Yes, he was. Yes, he was in, in the British army in India, not the Indian army, because there's always a great gulf between those two things. Yes. And what sort of a life was it for the offspring of an army officer in India in those days? I think a rather strange one. Actually, I left. India very, very quickly, because I mean, I, I don't really, I like to think I remember it, but I don't really, um, having heard a tremendous amount about it from, from my father and mother and uh, from various friends of theirs and, uh, and from my sister. I think children in those days, actually, they, ha they had a marvellous time from one point of view, because you had masses of servants, because servants were very cheap. You had a, I mean, my sister and I had an ayah each, an ayah being a, uh, um, a children's nurse and there would be people to do everything that you wanted done. Um, against that, it wasn't a very healthy place to grow up. It was more healthy than it was in the Victorian times, but it was, still wasn't a very healthy place to grow up. So I think most people wanted their children sent home fairly soon. What was uh, the reaction to the British there at that time? I think by then, um, there was a certain amount of India for the Indians going on at that time. I think it was pretty strong. It's a terribly difficult thing to describe just sort of in a sentence or two. It's, um, it's something you really want a couple of hours about, the extraordinary relationship that there was between, between the British and the Indians. It was, a, there was a great love, there was a great affection going both ways. Um, and there were obvious differences of opinion, and there were uh, and there were differences, but it was an extraordinary thing, and, and it has been grossly exaggerated in many times, especially quite recently in various films, that you know we were treading the Indians down into the ground with our feet on their necks, which was not the case at all. As witness to this, there were how many, a hundred million of them, and about a few thousand of us. So it wasn't like that at all and there was a tremendous amount of affection and uh, I know when when partition actually happened in, in the 1947 or whenever it was and uh, India was turned into a bloodbath through uh, politicians messing it all up as always all my father's friends and uh, my father's and mother's friends who who'd known the people in, in India and, and, and they were terribly worried and they kept on saying I remember when it was all going on you know, phone calls and people coming around, what's happened to so-and-so, have you heard of so-and-so, uh, I wonder what's happened in this part of India and that part of India, have you heard? And they heard from the people who'd served them, their, their bearers and their ayahs and, and uh, uh, all the various servants and the people who, who ran the place for the, for the English. Um, and they were terribly worried about it and, and, and very upset and uh, uh, concerned for them all. Back then to you, if we might, um, you say you left India fairly early. Uh, one presumes that was um, in the furtherance of education. No, it was actually um, because of my father. Um, he'd been badly wounded in the First World War, and uh, his wounds started to play him up. 
and uh, or they first of all said he was going to die, then he said he was going to chop his leg off, then they said he would never walk again, he eventually walked out all right, but they thought he'd better go back, he shouldn't serve in the Far East any longer. So he came back and was stationed at Winchester, so we went with him. Your early education then? My early education was at the Pilgrim School, Winchester, which was Winchester Cathedral Choir School, which was a prep school. Uh, at which I was not in the choir, I hasten to say. Uh, you were a chorister or a commoner, and I was very definitely a commoner. And I spent five happy years there. And then I went on to public school, which was at Canford, near Bournemouth, in Dorset. Where did this education lead you next? It led me... I'm afraid education had nothing to do with it, but it led me in those days, I'm afraid, straight into the army, because... In the 1950s, you had to do national service if you were fit in wind and limb. The, the regiment I was in, I was in the Wiltshires, and uh, they were in Hong Kong. So out I went to Hong Kong for about six months, where I had um, a marvellous uh, uh, sergeant major called Sergeant Major Baldry, who was uh, actually an Anglo-Indian, half, in, half Indian, half England, English, and um, he was a great character tremendous sense of humour and took the mickey out of me something rotten as they say um, I think because I was a public school boy in the ranks that was the first sort of thing and they used it to him and this was very much the same relationship that Sergeant Major Williams and Gunnar Graham had in It Ain't Hot Hot Mum and there were a lot of things which were, ran parallel uh, with me at that time um, I mean, the only thing I think that was different was that Gunnar Graham was uh, very strong left-wing principles, which I don't think I share. Um, but otherwise, there, were lo there was a lot in me uh, of Gunnar Graham, certainly in me at that time. Eventually, I came back, and then I was given a stripe, and then I was given another stripe, which made me a corporal. And then they just suddenly decided, oh, you know, wouldn't you like to be an officer? And they sent me to an officer cadet school, and I eventually became a second lieutenant in the Royal Hampshires. So, in actual fact, so far as us National Service fellows are concerned, you actually let the side down fairly appallingly there. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, yes. I went and had a pip on my shoulder. Terrible business. <laughs> I suppose, really, I ought to be standing up doing this interview, <laughs> never mind sitting down. Um, on demob. Yes, on demob, I went straight to RADA. Or rather, I didn't go straight to RADA. I went straight to the RADA audition, which they didn't think very much of me in, in the RADA audition. So I went to a place called Parada, the preliminary academy to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, can you believe? Which was a splendid place in, in um, Hornsey or somewhere like that. And I went there for a term. Then I went to RADA for two years. Tell us about RADA. First of all, uh, your contemporaries. Uh, my contemporaries, the people who were there, sort of famous people who were there, at that time, well, sort of there at the same time as me was Peter O'Toole and Albert Finney and Richard Bryars. Um, but I wasn't sort of in a class with them, I was sort of behind them. But in my class in productions I was in, oh, there was a splendid production of um, uh, Pygmalion with uh, Eliza being played by Glenda Jackson. I played Pickering and Jack Headley played Doolittle, would you believe? The Cockney Doolittle, which is not really Jack's cup of tea. When did you leave, rather? Somewhere around 56. And I went, straight after that, I went as an ASM and small parts. That it means assistant stage manager, which is the lowest form of life in the theatre. Um, and small parts to a theatre called the Palace Theatre Watford, which was at the end of the Bakerloo line. For all I know, it still is at the end of the Bakerloo line which was then run by Jimmy and Gilda Perry. That was a rather momentous thing for me. I was sort of shoved in at the deep end, as everybody was, into Weekly Rep, which was an amazing thing. I mean, Me Weekly Rep, I think, now doesn't exist. I <laughs> hope it doesn't exist. In a way, I hope it doesn't exist. And having spent, you know, like a, a whole term rehearsing a show, and going into the depth of the character and finding out what they had for breakfast and everything that you could imagine that they could think of. You suddenly were told, right, here's a script. In five days, you're on. And that sort of hits you in the pit of the stomach. And you suddenly have to really wake up and realize, are you going to be in this business or not? And a lot of people didn't. You know, a lot of people said, oh, no, I can't compete with this. I, you know, I must have my three weeks to rehearse. I can't do this at all. I must go. So they went. Um, but a lot of us didn't, and we soldiered on, and 
it, it made you, it was like a sort of douche of cold water and actually was very salutary. You had to go on, you had to do things quickly, you had to find out very quickly how to handle an audience because a lot of the stuff you did was comedy in Weekly Rep and you found how to handle an audience, what laughs were and how you timed them. And that was the most tremendous experience. Uh, there I met my wife, Mavis Pugh, who was in the company. Um, and I met Jimmy Perry. He'd written a very good part in, in, in a series um, which he was doing for ATV called Lollipop, which starred Peggy Mount and Hugh Lloyd. And this was a non-stop talking encyclopedia salesman who had digested encyclopedias. Can I ask you then, moving out of a, a RADA situation, which is almost ideal from the point of view of training, into weekly rep at uh, Watford, um, the bottom line has to be how much use was that RADA training then in the face of those new disciplines? It was the most tremendous use because you had all that background. You had the background of the basic lessons that you'd learnt for two years, like voice production. You knew how to place your voice. It, you didn't have to think about things any longer because they were by then part of you. You knew how to move, you knew how to make up, you knew how to learn lines, which is not an easy thing to do, although you had to learn them very much quicker. It was just that when you came to do weekly rep, you had to do everything very, very, very much faster. But you had that basic background of technique, mm. of, of knowing where to go, how to move, how to say the lines and don't bump into the furniture, uh, which was going to stand you in, in good stead over the years. And without that basic training, it, I think it would have been 300% more difficult. I take on board what you say, and you can see the logic of, of being taught how to learn lines and how, as you say, to move about, not bump into the furniture. Um, but we hear or we read of, I don't know if it's called method acting, of people in drama schools pretending to be trees and all this. Now, uh, with the greatest respect, where does this fit in to someone who is going to play uh, the father in D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers? Well, those sort of things are good for students because they break down the inhibitions. And we used to, uh, we were taught by a wonderful man at RADA called Richard Ainley, who was the son of Sir Henry Ainley, who was absolutely a marvellous teacher. And he, he was apt to say with great seriousness, he had a wonderful rich voice, which I can't do, unfortunately. But he was wonderful, and, and doing sh a scene in Shakespeare, and then, dear boy, you get under the table. And the poor student was sort of, Un under the table, Mr Ainley? There's nowhere else for you to go. And this was wonderful. You'd make you stand on your head or get up on a stepladder and stand on one foot. And he would make you see the logic for doing this and make you appear complete twit. And this was terribly good for your inhibitions, especially somebody like me who'd been in the army and had public school education and that sort of thing. Terribly good, full of inhibitions. And it was terribly good for you and it broke down all these strange things. Um, he would get you to break wind on stage. I mean, marvellous things, you know. And so, by the, by the end of this, you shouldn't have had any inhibitions left. Progress your career then forward from Watford. Many years of rep in all sorts of places. Folkestone, which was an absolute joy. Uh, Bath, Windsor, Liverpool, Coventry, all sorts of places. Interspersed with tours, tremendous amount of touring. Uh, in many, many different kinds of plays, um, and small parts on television. That was the sort of basic bread and butter acting that I did for some years. I think probably the first break I got was I was asked to take over the Brian Ricks part in One for the Pot. Now, Brian Ricks in those days ran the Whitehall Theatre. The Whitehall Theatre was Brown Ricks, and Brown Ricks was the Whitehall Theatre. And he had had, I don't know, he had the most amazing record. People never seem to mention this, but he had the most fantastic record. I can't remember what it was, but it was something like four plays in 20 years. And I played it for the rest of the run at the Whitehall, and then I went out on tour with it with John Slater. And it was a very, very happy engagement. And that gave me quite a sort of step up.
since you brought his name into the conversation, talk to us, if you will, about John Slater, who uh, seems to have been a very admired member of the theatre. John, yes, I liked him very much. Um, I always felt that John, God rest his soul, because he's not with us any longer, I think he, he sort of made a big mistake somewhere in the middle of his career because he was a very good actor. He was an excellent actor. He, was, he could have been, which is what he ended up as, he, could, he ended up as being one of our foremost character actors, which is what he was. But he had an obsession about being a clown and being a great comedian. He was good in comedy, very good, but he wasn't a clown. And he always wanted to play... Um, leading comedy parts before he met me and you know when he was sort of in his 30s I think if he'd have gone for being you know really one of our foremost character actors he would have gone much much higher in his profession and he was he was a lovely man great sense of humor um, lovely to work with and lovely to play with a generous man I adored him the massive difference twixt learning and performing in the theater and learning and performing in television? The great difference is that in the theatre you have a chance to get it right. <laughs> you, have, you have another day, you have another week if you're on tour, you think, I was terrible at Bogner. Never mind, I shall be wonderful at Cambridge. Or oh, I was awful at Cambridge, I shall be better at Oxford. Um, you do have this, you have a chance to get it right, you have a chance to try the scene in a different way, to try the line in a different way, to think, I've been saying this for the last five weeks, I've been saying it all wrong. There's a wonderful story about um, a famous American actress, Lynn Fontane, who she and Alfred Lunt used to play together, and uh, she, she said that there was the last line in the play, and she'd played it for a long run in Broadway, and she, and she knew that it was, she'd said it well, but she'd never said it quite in the right way. And she tried it this way, and she tried it that way, and uh, she'd asked her husband, and she'd asked the director, which is probably the same person, and she'd never got it quite right. And on the last night, she suddenly, two seconds before she said it, she knew how to say it, and she said it the right way. And I think that's why actors like the theatre above anything else, because there's always another chance. In filming, there is another chance, too, even filming for television, because you can have another take. You usually can have another take. In television, there is no time for anything. You can always have another take, except I'm told in the early episodes of Crossroads. Uh, <laughs> but, but laying that aside, does that not, though, by definition, lull an actor into a sense of false security television, the, the opportunities within television to keep doing it and keep doing it? In television, no, because there's no time. There's no time for anything in television. And there the literally isn't. I mean, I'm not being funny about it. The time sh schedule is so tight that you can, I mean, you can have retakes in things. Of course you can. But they're only very limited. And you can't have a retake on every single shot, which is what filming is. Every single shot is a different setup, and, and you have as many takes as, as you like to get, it, get the thing right. But on television, you have to do a whole scene, and you have several cameras which are moving around, taking you from different angles. And so there's, there's a certain amount of time, but there's never enough time. So you are, in actual fact, telling me again that there is a difference uh, between film and television. Oh, yes, 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 very strong. If there is an easy answer, what launched you onto the public? I suppose I was launched onto the public really through Dane Tough Old Mum. I mean, I had done a lot of comedy shows before that, and my face was sort of faintly familiar. I used to get people saying, hello, don't I know you? Or did you go in our golf club? And did you teach my daughter science or something? You know, because I look like faintly scholarly, I suppose. I used to get that sort of recognition in the street. They knew the face, but they couldn't put the name to it. And I suppose Dane Tough Old Mum did. That's, this was... La di da Gunner Graham in It Ain't Off Hot Mum, written by Jimmy Perry and David Croft, which ran for about nine years. We have had Windsor Davis as a guest, but talk us through a little bit of it from your point of view. It, it was a lovely show to do. We enjoyed it. Uh, there were, uh, I think, 13 of us, 12 or 13 eventually. 
Um, we were all speaking to each other at the end of nine years, which I think is pretty good going. Um, it was a lovely show to do. The, the thing that I liked about it, I think, is that it basically was, it was true. It was authentic. And that is a lovely thing to have, that you get people who came up to you and said, my father was in the army and he says it was exactly like that. Or uh, chaps who used to come up and said, we had a concert party, a terrible concert party, even worse than yours. And we had a Gloria in ours and we had a Solly in ours. And there was a, there was a Lardy Dargunagram who played the piano, used to who'd been to a university, all this sort of thing. And so you got that authentic feel, which was a lovely thing to have of, uh, a kickback from the audience. Amusing anecdotes in respect of it ain't half hot, Mum. There was one rather nice one when we were all supposed to be in an aeroplane going, flying to Fu Manchu or wherever the hell we were going. And we were, it was a mock up of a fuselage of, a, of, a, of, a, of an aircraft in the studio. And there were two chaps, big burly prop men, who rocked this arrangement to and fro to simulate bumping along on, on, on a sort of rather tatty old plane over India in 1945. And there was a certain amount of ad-libbing going on, and David had David Croft, the director and co uh, the producer and co-writer of the show, had said, you know, you can ad-lib a little bit in this, you know, if something goes wrong and something falls down with the shaking, you know, just sort of ad-lib, and there was a little bit of this going on. And the door of the aeroplane was on a, was a was slid to and fro, and on one of the very violent uh, 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 lurches that these prop men were giving us, Kenneth MacDonald, who was playing Nobby, he had been rushing about, ad-libbing physically, not ad-libbing uh, 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 vocally, but ad-libbing physically rather a lot. And he, this had caught him off balance, and he fell out. And on the next, on the next shudder from the prop men, the door swung to, slung to again. And nobody noticed this. There was so much going on. There were so many lines going on. And Windsor was walking up and down, saying, "Put yourself together, put yourself together." And Melvin Hayes was saying, "Oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die." You know, all this sort of thing was going on. And eventually, it came to one of Nobby's lines, and there was an awful pause. And everybody looked round and said, "Where's Nobby?" And this little face appeared at the window outside, I mean, 3,000 feet up, tapping on the window and saying, please, can I come in? <laughs> <laughs> where, where to next? Well, at the end of this show, sort of halfway through the show, I, I had always, I think from my Indian background, I had been fascinated with the work of Rajal Kipling. I had left India, as I said, when I was a child. I didn't really know much about it. And I always wanted to know more about this, which was, to me, a magic country where I was born. And the person you turned to in those days, certainly, was Kipling. And my parents had all the books. And I read them assiduously. And had always been a great Kipling fan, especially the Indian stories and the Indian poems. And um, it always was in my mind to do something like to dramatize a short story or something. And then I thought, oh, I don't know. When I started going bald, I thought, do you know, I think I could look like Kipling. And so I thought, well, I'd do a thing of his life. I was going to do the whole life, although it wasn't just time. It was a show that would go on for about three days or something. Um, and then when it ain't our fault mom came along, I thought, well, I have um, a connection in the public's mind with India, so why not turn these two things to advantage? So I decided to do a, uh, a one-man show telling the story of Kipling's life, his early life in India, and the India of the Raj, the India of the 1880s, entirely in his own words, to use not a single word of anything other than Kipling's own. And you could do this because he very often wrote in the first person. And he wrote also um, a, a volume of autobiography, which I could use very sparingly. And so I showed this, I sort of got together half a show, and I showed it to my wife, Mavis Pugh, and I said, because she directs as well, and I said, you know, what do you think of this? Would you like to direct it? And she said she would, um, but she said the show wasn't right. So then we shaped the show together, the two of us, and eventually we put it on. Uh, we tried it out at a couple of places. Uh, when It Ain't Half Up, Mum had finished. And then we took it to the Edinburgh Festival in 1981. We mounted a fringe production, our own production 
which is the most tremendous experience. It's a wonderful thing to do, to go, I mean, any, any young act, I say, go and do something on the Edinburgh Fringe, because there's nothing like it in the world. Um, and it did terribly well there. Um, it got some lovely notices, and it did absolute capacity business, which was nice. Um, I even made a profit, I think, of about five pounds. Um, <laughs> And then it went to the it transferred to the Gate Theatre in London, Notting Hill Gate. And then for a whole year after that, we did it at um, uh, festivals and theatres and art centres and what are euphemistically called venues all, all over the country. And since then, we've done it here and there, sort of whenever we've been asked. And suddenly in 1988, the beginning of 1988, I was asked to go and do it um, at the British Museum for the British Library. And there were some people there who said, oh, come and do it in our theatre. And so in 1988, we took out another tour, and we did it, I think, at um, 18 different venues all up and down the country. When you say you only referred sparsely to the autobiographical work of Kipling, how then did you portray him? Well, when, when I meant sparsely, it, I, I just used the actual autobiography, something of myself. I used one or two sort of sentences out of that uh, to link the poems and the stories. And I give, a, I give a, an impression of Kipling. I mean, I don't absolutely give a strict impersonation because I don't really know what he sounded like. We do know he had a, a, a very pleasant voice and somebody once described it as an actor's voice. So I thought, oh, well, that's rather nice. Um, uh, and I give, I suppose, an impression of him. That's all you can say. But I do it through his own words. He said, uh, one of the last poems he wrote, he said, seek not to question other than the books I leave behind. And I've kept to that. Uh, by implication, then, are you able to have formed any opinion of him? Oh, yes, 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 a very strong opinion. Um, he was a very, uh, uh, you, when you're talking about a, a, as a man, yes. Um, he was a very private person. He was a very, he kept a very strong shutter between himself and the public. I mean, I think the idea of a sh an actor portraying him in a show, he would think quite horrendous. I'm hoping that if he saw it looking down from the clouds, he might think, oh, well, it's done quite well, so that's all right. But he hated any sort of publicity or anything like that. Um, he was a man of very strong held opinions, but he was a very, very complex man. And it's not, I mean, you know, I, I need to talk for about three hours just to tell you what I think about Kipling, but he, it's not easy to say, to, to sort of pinpoint his opinions and to say that he was um, the empire right or wrong and a very staunchly patriotic person is true up to a point, but only up to a point. He was a very subtle man. He had many, many sides to his character. Now to come perhaps closer to home, um, you say you were married. That's right. My wife is Mavis Pugh, who uh, is at the moment doing a series called You Rang My Lord for Jimmy Perry and David Croft. Um, we've been married, I think it's 30 years. Any children? No. To conclude this show, a particularly favourite moment of your career that you savour, perhaps, above all the others? Perhaps there is. Uh, it's a very difficult question, this one, but I think perhaps there is. Uh, I was asked to go and play Gonzalo in The Tempest at the Ludlow Festival, and there is nothing like that in the whole world. You do it in the open air, in with the backdrop of this fantastic castle behind you, and as the sun goes down, the lights come up on stage, and it is the most magical feeling to stand there on this stage in the middle of, and it's really in the heart of England, and to be delivering some of the most marvelous lines that have ever been written by anybody in the middle of the English countryside, completely out in the open. There is just nothing like it in the whole world.